Dr. Mill is a graduate of Brown University Warren Alvo Medical School. He holds a degree in psychology and medicine. Presently specializes in behavior and forensic medicine in Cambridge, Massachusetts. For 30 years, he was a clinical instructor in medicine at Harper Medical School. His medical interests include clinical reasoning and medical decision making. And his professional focus includes parental ammunition and other type of pathological alignment. Well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Okay, now, there's a group of people who specialize in alienation and estrangement. And it's a relatively small group. If you could imagine a uh, hundred years ago, medical specialties were just being developed. Until the 1920s, there was really no such thing as a medical specialist. There were surgeons and there were general medical doctors, but that was about it. And I believe it was in the 20s, I didn't double check this, suddenly we decided to have specialties. Well, mental health professionals are somewhat behind in that regard. If you have a PhD in clinical psychology or whatever else degree it might be, there is an assumption that you know everything. And that whatever the field might be, you can come to court and you're a quote expert. And I, I've been asked by many lawyers, is there a difference between an expert and a specialist? Absolutely, there's a huge difference. I happen to also have boards in internal medicine. Technically, I'm an expert on everything. Okay, I mean, if someone says, you, well, you're a board certified internist, uh, are you an expert on the heart? Oh, yes, absolutely, I would never say no. On the other hand, I'm not a cardiologist, and I wouldn't call myself a heart specialist, but it turns out that this particular field actually requires specialty level expertise in many areas. And anyone who doesn't have that level of expertise is likely to step on a lot of landmines trying to tiptoe across the field. All right, moving along, if this clicker works now. Um, I'm going to switch glasses again. Okay, last summer, Dr. Burnett and uh, Ms. Gottlieb and I gave some talks in Europe, Stockholm, London, and I gave two presentations in London, and I wanted to show you the title slides because I think the titles are important and instructive. First of all, I spoke on how can and should professionals accurately distinguish between alienation and estrangement. And the point for you here today is, as Dr. Burnett said, scientifically, we have science here, and it's basically settled science. There are nuances that are still controversial, but alienated children do not resemble estranged children except in very superficial ways, and it's relatively easy for someone like Dr. Burnett or Ms. Gottlieb or hopefully myself uh, to distinguish between the two. And yet what we see in family court is they'll find a hired gun to come in and say, oh, it's a young field, we really don't know anything. And judges need to see through that, it's nonsense. The next talk in London was on treatment. One on diagnosis, one on treatment. Uh, the title there, why in general are traditional therapies worse than worthless for the treatment of parental alienation, question mark, and who says so? And if I had time, I would then show you the evidence I showed them. There's really no debate about this at all. Five years ago, last month, I sat at that table, and I said there has not been a single case in the history of the world in which anything that resembled traditional therapy had been effective for severe cases of parental alienation. And I put my palms up, if memory serves me well, and I said, if you disagree, I await your data. Well, it's been over five years, and not a single expert, specialist, clinician, or anyone else has brought me any data to suggest that traditional therapy, or anything like it, uh, will be effective in the setting. And yet, the family courts order it all the time, and the mental health professionals provide it. Well, it's not ethical to provide treatment that is known to be ineffective to anyone. On top of that, uh, notice it says worse than worthless. Not only doesn't it work, but it is usually harmful. OK, so let me show you a couple of my slides from five years ago. 
and I'm going to make short work of this. I, I felt back then, and I see it today, the family court system requires extensive reform. I hope that something's been accomplished since then, but I'm not up on what's been happening in your state. Uh, next, custody evaluations are clinical evaluations and require highly skilled clinicians. Unfortunately, the supply of those is not, uh, not adequate. And the take home point for this meeting is that judges are not clinicians, understandably, and they have to rely on other experts for their information. But I would encourage the judges to be a little bit skeptical as to whether you're getting a bona fide expert, if not a specialist in this area. Um, many of the issues are clinical issues, and again, one needs special expertise. This is a plug for additional training. We're not going to turn the judges and lawyers into clinicians, but they can at least have a working knowledge of the difference between good clinical practice and not so good clinical practice. Um, and therefore, my fourth point five years ago was we need better education for everyone involved, not just the judges or the lawyers, but the clinicians, mental health professionals, and so on. Uh, the other slide, back then I used this, uh, was that parental alienation is an epidemic now. Um, nine years ago, the Association of Family and Conciliation Courts uh, devoted the entire international conference in Denver to parental alienation. Trust me, international organizations that are affiliated with the courts do not devote a multi-day conference, I think it was three or four days, to a topic uh, that, that is not a big problem or a condition that is rare. Um, so I won't repeat the rest of the slide, but this was five years ago and I don't know that we're making adequate progress at this point five years later. Um, so back to the present talk, I have some limited goals today. This is a consciousness raising session. I realize I can't do justice to pretty much anything, but I can hopefully raise awareness. Uh, I'd like to try to identify a few of the key problems, a few of the possible solutions, and most of all, I'm trying to give people a conceptual framework and a few conceptual tools so that when you think about this, you'll have the language and the vocabulary and even the concepts that you would need to think about it productively. Uh, again, as Dr. Burnett said, this is science. You don't really get to make it up, at least not with credibility. Um, I think a lot of the people who deal with this who don't have that training need to remember that if your only tool is a, prop, is a hammer, every problem tends to look like a nail. Uh, so, what are the key topics? Well, child maltreatment, look at the first bullet. Um, that term maltreatment, for those of you who are not in the field, encompasses both abuse and neglect. Uh, and what types of abuse and neglect we have, physical, sexual, psychological, and emotional. It's not a long list. The take home point here is that we have a mountain of research, tens of thousands of high quality uh, well, tens of thousands of subjects, high quality studies, to show that psychological and emotional abuse are at least as risky and damaging to children as physical and even sexual abuse. Now, I made a statement like that in court a year or two ago, and opposing counsel said, that's an insult to the victims of sexual abuse. No, that's an empirical observation, and it's a fact. If you track these people, and we have the studies, famous ACE study from 20 years ago, ACE stands for Adverse Childhood Experiences, 1998, if you're looking this up, first, office, uh, first author is Felitti, uh, found that adverse childhood experiences were major risk factors for premature death from physical illness in adulthood. Heart disease, lung disease, cancer, and so on. There were over 9,500 children in that initial study alone. We're talking tens of thousands of children. We know what the outcomes are. And the outcomes for adverse childhood experiences are number one, poor, and number two, just as poor from psychological and emotional abuse as physical 
or even sexual abuse. I'm repeating myself on, pers on purpose. So if you're a judge, and I hear this all the time, oh, Judge Smith isn't going to believe that this is abuse if it wasn't physical. That's not okay anymore. This is not 1985. So I, I don't mean any disrespect there, but there's science here, and we need to have the science inform what happens in family court. Uh, briefly, I'll give you a few definitions. If you look at the slide, child alignment is a general term. Sometimes it's normal. I like my mom better at the age of three than my dad, for obvious reasons. When I grew up, I realized they were both wonderful. Parental alienation, estrangement, Dr. Burnett defined those. Another big deal, however, is pathological enmeshment. A lot of the kids are enmeshed with the other parent, which in brief means that the parent has essentially engulfed the child. I like to say mind, body, and soul, obliterated any boundary between the parent and the child uh, to the point where the child is a companion and a friend, not a child. The child's there to meet the parent's needs and the, not the parent meeting the child's needs. And this is a horrible adverse childhood experience. Horrible to have boundaries violated or obliterated on an ongoing basis. These children grow up to have a, a, a multitude of serious mental health problems, with rare exceptions. So again, th there's a dismissive attitude that I see in family court as if, you know, I've been a judge or I've been a lawyer, or I've been a therapist for a long time, and that that's enough to handle this type of a thing. All right, the final bullet domestic violence. I'm going to speak about that later, shortly, but just to foreshadow, a lot of the domestic violence uh, people who are admirably uh, uh, speaking out against domestic violence tend to be dismissive of parental alienation and they claim that it's just a bogus uh, defense for abusive parents. Well, you know what? That's like saying, I believe all lumps uh, in the breast are benign, or I believe they're all cancer, and not making an attempt to distinguish one from the other. We have the science to tell what's going on in a given case. The answer is not to dismiss the other side's positions. They're both very important, critical, and the idea is to bring in someone with the expertise who actually knows how to tell one from another. Um, so I have this slide to set up the fact that there are many, many types of people who work for the court. Take an eyeball at that, and I want to say something about it. Um, this has been studied, and what I mean by this is the expertise of mental health professionals. Here's one study. If I had an hour or two, I could give you many studies. This one is by Timothy Baker, no relation to a prominent doctor, Amy Baker, who does PA research. And Baker, 10 years ago, published a study with the following conclusions. Um, the short version is that clinical psychology seems to be locked in the pre-scientific era. It is practicing, or most clinical psychologists are practicing at a point in time that was similar to where medicine was about 100 years ago. Uh, I don't consider that a joke. I consider that an accurate assessment of the situation. And I apologize in advance to clinical psychologists who are offended by that. But they put a number on it, and they said about 80% of clinical psychologists, when given a choice between science and their own intuition, will go with intuition and reject the science. That led a prominent science writer by the name of Sharon Bagley to write, mm -hmm, make this work, OK to publish a piece in Newsweek entitled, Ignoring the Evidence, Why Do Psychologists Reject Science? I'll read a little bit of this. When confronted with evidence that treatments, I have to read it from here. When confronted with evidence that treatments they offer are not supported by science, clinicians argue that they know better than some study what works. Baker's team suggests a new accreditation system to, quote, stigmatize a scientific training programs and practitioners. That may produce a new generation of therapists who apply science, but it won't do a thing about those now in practice. I submit this for the benefit of judges and of other decision makers in family court who understandably, if I just do what Dr. Jones says, I can't be criticized. 
But that's a problem if Dr. Jones is in the 80% of people who don't believe in science, the 80% of psychologists. And I don't think lawyers do a whole lot better here, just so I don't fail to insult anyone. Uh, now, Walter Michel is one of the most influential living psychologists. He wrote an editorial to accompany the original study and to just do it no justice, uh, one sentence was, the disconnect between what clinicians do and what science has discovered is an unconscionable embarrassment. Michelle, by the way, was the, uh, was the principal investigator behind the famous marshmallow experiments in the uh, 60s, 70s, and 80s. All right, moving along. Max Planck, Nobel laureate in physics, once said, an important scientific innovation rarely makes its way by gradually winning over and converting its opponents. What does happen is its opponents die out. <laughs> and so I am not all that optimistic that we're going to get people to change. I hope so, uh, but we may have to wait a while for the new generation to understand this from the start. Um, shifting gears. One, one of my messages that we have science and we need to apply it. Um, I think people need to ask when they're hearing expert testimony or reading a GAL report or whatever, is this science or pseudoscience? Is it science or is it a belief system? Uh, or is it ideology masquerading as science? And those things run rampant. I think another problem is pseudo-controversies. Uh, we still have people testifying that PA doesn't exist, that PA is, is, is a scam, that, the, the, you know, abusive parents used to take custody away from fine, you know, fine parents. It's not a syndrome and so forth. I'm not going to dwell on this, but beware of pseudo-controversies as well. I was personally in court recently when a judge who would later issue an unconscionable ruling waved his hand and said, well, I know it's controversial, as if, well, it's controversial, I'll throw it out. Well, there's a lot of pseudo-controversies in this field. All right. So there are some standard of practice issues. I don't want to waste too much time on this either. Just look at the bottom line. In medicine, we don't use quality assurance anymore, believe it or not. There's a feeling that nothing can assure quality. Instead, we've substituted CQI, which is continuous quality improvement, which means you're always critiquing yourself. The patient didn't live. What could we have done better? Bill, you should have given the adrenaline sooner. And the key point is no one gets defensive about that. I've tried to do this with attorneys and others in the field, and everyone's back is up, and I can't even point out the simplest mistake without having people walk out of the room or, or attack me in, in return. Um, so how much time is left now? Just all know where I am. Ten minutes. Ten minutes. Okay, good. So one of the things that I observed many years ago, and I spoke here about five years ago, is that parental alienation is the most counterintuitive thing I've seen in all of clinical practice, not just in psychiatry or psychology, completely. And people think, when I say that, I'm warning them to be careful. So I'm not warning you to be careful, or if I am, I'm going much beyond that. What I'm saying is, unless you specialize in alienation and estrangement, specialize in the sense that a cardiologist who only puts in pacemakers specializes, you have almost no chance of getting most of the major points right. And I realize that's a very strong statement. I have dozens and dozens of, of cases that I've been involved with, hundreds really, to show that that's true. So um, let me give you a little bit more on that. Many people claim to go by the book. Uh, many people who claim to go by the book have never read the book or even know which book. Here's just one book. This is something I wrote about seven years ago. Uh, cases of severe alienation are likely to be highly counterintuitive. Clinicians who attempt to manage them without adequate skills are likely to find themselves presiding over a cascade of clinical and psychosocial disasters. I'm a litigation consultant as well as an expert witness. And that's usually what's gone on when I get a new case. There's a cascade of clinical and psychosocial disasters because people think they can use intuition to solve counterintuitive problems. And they can't. And one of the aspects of someone who is using intuition 
to solve problems, especially if they should be using uh, knowledgeable analysis, is that you have great confidence in your incorrect conclusions. Because if something is intuitive, it feels right to you. And if you put a touch of arrogance on top of that, you have a recipe for disaster. Um, OK, so I think I'm going to skip this, except see the thing that's underlined in red? One of the things you need to navigate this is highly specific, highly sophisticated pattern recognition. And if you don't have it, you can't fake it. Um, I'll give you an example of that shortly. Um, I don't remember whether I have a slide coming up, so I'm going to give you a medical example of something that's counterintuitive. If you have a hyperactive child, and you need to medicate the child because he's flunking out of school or driving everyone crazy in class. We use a stimulant. We use Ritalin, methylphenidate. Now, imagine family court where they hire someone to say, oh, that would be horrible. You're going to give the boy a stimulant? Are you crazy? And then they bring in Dr. Burnett, who says, well, I know it's counterintuitive, but that turns out to be the treatment of choice. If I were the judge, in a case like that, and I had no real training, I would not listen to Dr. Burnett. I would be thinking, well, yeah, that's crazy. You want to give a stimulant to a hyperactive child? No way that's going to happen. Can't really fault the guy, but that's my plea for better education. Uh, you, that's using intuition in a situation where it's going to fail you. All right, so let me give you six counterintuitive arguments that we see. Uh, related to parental alienation. But I must stress, these are just illustrations. I don't really see myself talking about PA today. My main message is this is an example of the kind of thing that happens all the time in family courts, not just here in Connecticut. I've got cases right now in six or seven countries, at least a dozen states. This no place is any different. I think you guys might be a little behind the curve in some ways, maybe ahead of the curve in other ways. But these are general illustrations of why you need better training for your courts and related professionals. First of all, most judges and most professionals use what we call the high conflict model. That simply holds that uh, both parties always participate. If only these people could put their children's needs ahead of their own. If only they could love their children as much as they hate each other. And this is a disaster. And I, I don't know that I've ever met a judge who didn't use this model. Uh, maybe a few of them override it, but it isn't very many. And this is a good example of using intuition instead of knowledge base. So there's so many problems with this, I wouldn't know where to begin. I'm going to dwell on it for a couple more minutes. But looking at this slide, first it assumes that both parents have contributed significantly, not necessarily equally. But that's not fair. If you're dealing with someone who has a severe personality disorder and the other person is trying to manage a horrible family crisis, to start scolding the two of them equally is unconscionable conduct. And even if you're doing it from a lack of understanding, it's still not OK. You can't have it both ways. Either you're going to get adequate training to handle this sort of a situation, or you're not. And if you decide not to have the training, then you can't really say, well, gee, no one told me or at least not with credibility. Um, so again, you can eyeball the rest of the slide, but this is a recipe for disaster, to use the phrase again. Um, here are some of the types of things that you see in court in terms of personality disorders. There are many other types of mental disorders. But personality disorders um, are very common in family court. Uh, that's another reason it's not fair to say both parties participated. Before I ever heard about parental alienation, I was a dyed-in-the-wool specialist in these particular personality disorders, borderlines, narcissists, sociopaths, and so on. Um, so let's talk about that just a little bit. Uh, borderline personality disorder is extremely common. I'm going to show you the figures in a minute. Uh, these folks are so obsessed with presenting themselves as normal in fact, presenting themselves as perfect, uh, that they'll fly under the radar unless you have a real pro interviewing them. They, they interview excellently, very well. They've learned to convincingly mimic normal behavior. Uh, they are master manipulators. They are accomplished liars. And it's a rare forensic psychologist in an interview or two who would spot it. Uh, briefly, severe cognitive distortions, 
emotional dysregulation, and extreme or bizarre behavior. Uh, if you're dealing with that in family court and you don't realize it and you're using the high conflict model, you're not going to make very good decisions. Uh, lots of literature on this, just really quickly, uh, just show you a few books. Anyone who wants to read about this could get any one of these books. This last one, Splitting, is about litigating with these people. And next, I'll show you an article from the New England Journal of Medicine written by someone I know, Jim Groves at Mass General Hospital, 1981. This is my favorite opening paragraph to any medical article I have ever, ever read. So I'm going to read it to you now, if I can see it. In 1682, the English physician Thomas Sydenham captured the essence of borderline personality disorder in a single phrase. All is caprice, he wrote. They love without measure those whom they will soon hate without reason. Three centuries later, this rem remains the most succinct diagnostic statement ever made about one type of pathologically dependent patient. I was sitting in court <coughs> only a few months ago when a judge put an, a severely alienated child on the stand who then denigrated his mother hatefully for 20 minutes and the judge turned and said, are you listening to your son, ma'am? Are you listening to the boy, how angry he is? That was unconscionable. And it showed a profound lack of understanding of what you're dealing with when you're dealing with this type of a personality disorder in one but not both parents. Um, the prevalence is high. I'm going to zip along. Suffice it to say, let me just do these slides for you. So borderlines alone are somewhere in the 5 to 6 percent, but that's general population. If you look at clinical populations, it's higher. If you look at inpatients, that's higher still. In family court, where you've got high conflict people, you see it all the time. It's, it's not a rare or uncommon thing, it's almost the rule. I don't have a good number, but I'd say it's probably more than a third, maybe as much as a half, maybe even more. So if you're not aware of these things, I'm going to skip a few slides, if you're not aware that you may be dealing with this sort of a personality disorder in one party and not the other, you're going to make a lot of bad decisions. Uh, okay, second, the f next few points I'm going to make quick work of. Second counterintuitive point, I've already made it, unless the mental health professional specializes in alienation and estrangement, uh, you're going to get a lot of wrong answers. The third counterintuitive point, children will rarely, if ever, reject a non-abusive parent. Now this is a great example of where lawyers can get into big trouble. They speak to the kid, kid interviews great. Kid says, mom's perfect, dad's rotten. Listen to the voice of the child. Uh, you would have to be an extremely sophisticated interviewer of children, of alienated children, to see through that. And it, it, you know, I think it's predictable what then happens. What you should be thinking is, what? This, this is a non-abusive parent. It's very implausible that the child would reject the parent in that situation. Number four. Um, when the children do reject the parent, they don't look anything like estranged children. I should say that better. Alienated children do not resemble estranged children except in superficial ways. Dr. Burnett explained there are eight signs or manifestations that are highly characteristic of alienated children, but not estranged children. I've personally seen an expert come to court recently and say, oh, but you can't reason backwards. Absolutely, positively, you can. If that were true, we'd all be out of business and I wouldn't be able to diagnose a heart attack. <laughs> so, uh, nonsense. Uh, number five, um, another area that is settled science and that is not debatable, parental alienation meets standard definitions and standard criteria for psychological child abuse or maltreatment. Uh, let me show you a couple of those definitions. From the DSM, child psychological abuse is non-accidental verbal or symbolic acts by a child's parent or caregiver that result or have reasonable potential to result in significant psychological harm to the child. Well, if PA doesn't meet that definition, I don't know what would. Significant potential to harm the child. That's the definition. Now, I don't really think it's appropriate for lawyers, judges, or anyone else to decide that they don't really care what the mental health community thinks. They've got their own definition. Uh, next, the American Professional Society on the Abuse of Children. I'm going to just say it has a similar 
definition and move on. I will read you two of the examples from that organization, American Professional Society on the Abuse of Children. Um, one example, under exploiting corrupting, is restricting or interfering with or directly undermining the child's important relationships, for example, with the other parent. That's pretty clear. And under terrorizing the child, is placing the child in a loyalty conflict by making the child choose unnecessary, well, sorry, making the child unnecessarily choose to have a relationship with one parent or the other. If you put those two examples together, you have an operational definition of parental alienation. Now, again, this is about family court reform. It, I respectfully submit it's not okay for either a judge to be unaware of this or to say, well, I don't agree. That's not what you put someone on the bench for, in my respectful opinion. You put someone on the bench to apply the known science. Um, the fifth and sixth and final point, uh, I said this earlier, except in very mild cases, anything that resembles traditional therapy, including family therapy in a traditional sense, simply doesn't work and is likely to make things worse. Uh, here's a quote from something I wrote uh, seven or so years ago. Therapists who insist on a trial of conventional therapy to see for myself are exceedingly unlikely to succeed. Um, such an approach is worse than worthless because while the therapist provides futile treatment, the child already injured is deprived of effective intervention, including protection. I, again, five years ago, I said, if you disagree with this, I await your data. Not a single person has come to me, and not to mention that I gave this presentation in Europe and many other places. No one's come up to me with any data to suggest otherwise. So um, here, for example, is a quote from the book Bill mentioned earlier. Uh, a thousand children, our research continues to confirm that even under court order, traditional therapies are of little, if any, benefit in regard to treating this form of child abuse. And this book was published by the American Bar Association. A thousand cases no definite benefit. And some therapists say, well, I'm not doing traditional therapy. I'm doing family therapy. Yeah, that's exactly <laughs> what doesn't work unless it's modified to the point where you wouldn't recognize it. Um, OK, I'm almost done. So my last slide is, I think there really is an urgent need for reform. I think the main component should be additional training. I have a lot of parents criticize the you know, the court for being unethical and so forth. And I don't necessarily have an opinion about that, but I like to remember Hanlon's razor, which holds, in case you haven't heard of it, never attribute anything to malice that can be adequately explained through lack of understanding. And I have to tell most of my clients, no, this is an educational issue. You know, most of these are good people, but they're practicing outside the limits of their core expertise. And the answer to that is education. Uh, and that's what I like to see myself as being a medical educator. So thank you very much. Appreciate it.